Coming up on Tech News Weekly, a robot that talks to you with GIFs, the complicated life of emoji in the courtroom, a first look at the Samsung Galaxy S10, Nest Secure's hidden microphone, and what happens when kids realize that their lives have been shared online for years by their parents. All that more coming up next on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 71, recorded Thursday, February 21st, 2019. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by FreshBooks, the all-in-one cloud accounting solution helping small business owners thrive. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash TNW. And by LinkedIn Talent Solutions. Find the right people for your business this year at linkedin.com slash tech news and get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is a show where every week we talk to the people making and breaking the tech news. I am Megan Maroney. And I'm Jason Howell. Today we're going to learn definitively how you pronounce it, right? We are. But first we need to remind people uh, they only have a few days to take our survey. And that, that's want- what I meant. <laughs> how to pronounce survey. Survey. It's survey. How do not you pronounce su- not survey? Not servery, which is a common misspelling <laughs> that I do when I try to type survey. Yeah, I always exactly. do servery. Uh, twit.to slash survey19. Uh, that's how you do it. Do it. Tell, tell us what you love. Tell us what you hate. Tell us a little bit about you. Uh, you know all the answers to the questions. Don't yeah. worry. It's nothing. There's nothing hard. But but now, now. Yeah, we're not testing you on how to pronounce GIF or GIF or whatever no, the no, heck no, it is. No, 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 no. But, but, you know, uh, let's talk about personal assistance a little okay. bit. The, the hardest way, the biggest problem with communicating with them is that they don't communicate like humans with GIFs. So true. And emoji and memes. And one roboticist set out several years ago to change all that. Welcome Abhishek Singh, creator of the Pico Robot. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the show. I uh, I know you've been working on this a long time, but I first saw it uh, earlier this week and I immediately uh, fell in love. So um, I want everyone else to fall in love too. Uh, tell me what is Pico? Well, that's exactly the kind of uh, response I get want people uh, to elicit in people is that feeling of falling in love with Pico. <laughs> so Pico is a personal uh, robot. He's a completely hackable, programmable personal robot that responds entirely through uh, GIFs and video. Um, I've built him out as a do-it-yourself kit, so you can actually get the joy and the pleasure of building him out yourself. Um, And he's currently up on Kickstarter, so you can go ahead and back the production of building out these kits and get one for yourself. I have backed it. I I missed the early bird backing, um, but it was worth it. Uh, When I fall in love, you can't, you know, easily separate. You you can't put price to love. (laughs) Exactly. There's no price on love when it comes to robots. Uh, So how long have you been working on Pico? Uh, so, so Pico, I mean, this entire process has definitely been a journey. So I started working on the first initial prototype of Pico about like four years ago. Um, and that was a time where I personally had absolutely no idea about programming. I had no idea about hardware. I had didn't know the difference between an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and this was one of like the first projects I picked up to get familiar with some of these things because I personally believe a lot in uh, learning by doing um, and project-based learning. So that's how it kind of started. Um, so it's been about like four years. Uh, it's gone through several iterations. And if you check out the Kickstarter, you can see kind of the progression and the evolution of Pico over the years. Um, and um, yeah, so it's it started off as just this little uh, robot, which I built with the intention that I was spending so many hours myself alone by myself in front of the computer that I thought it would be interesting to have a little desktop companion that would provide these little moments of delight and entertainment to get me through the day. Um, and over the course of that um, thing, eventually the, the idea came up that I should have it respond uh, through GIFs and videos because how else do I communicate with my friends and how else do we communicate in this new age of uh, uh, instant messaging? Um, and it would give it not only a unique personality, but at the same time, it would get rid of that entire conversation of how do we get robots to emote and how do we make something that's approachable and engageable. I love that uh, that it's a kit that, that people can put together. How complicated yes. is this? It's based on Raspberry Pi, right? 
Yes, so it was, it's based on the Raspberry Pi and that was a purposeful decision because the Raspberry Pi comes with its own entire um, active huge community and I wanted to be an educational experience. I wanted to kind of uh, people to be able to learn by building it themselves um, and at the same time be able to program and hack it themselves. So so yeah, it is based on the Raspberry Pi. The kit is extremely simple to kind of put together. I have focused on designing it in such a way that the only thing you need is essentially a Phillips screwdriver, uh, no expensive soldering irons, no specific tools uh, which we might not have lying at home. And, and the kit will come with that specific screwdriver as well. Hmm. It looks like Pico can wear different outfits. Is that true? Pico can wear different outfits, yes. Um, and I, I wanted that also to be like one of his customization aspects uh, in terms of like you might like Pico in a certain way and I might like him with a certain different look completely. Uh, so uh, while the kit doesn't come with different clothes, uh, the ability to add your own um, outfit to him is extremely simple. It's just one single stitch line and a couple of holes. So... Um Obviously, the communication language is animated, GIFs or GIFs, however you want, whatever floats your boat. Um, I don't even know where I stand on that because I flip-flop so often. Neither do I. Uh, so those uh, videos, that's the language here. How, like, what, where are you pulling those from? And is there any sort of repetition? Like, if, if someone was to give the same question five times in a row, five different GIFs and, and videos, or how, how is that supported? Yeah, so, so, so that's a great question. So another big benefit of using these GIFs and videos as a response system is that uh, you don't get the same boring responses to common questions. So it always keeps it kind of fresh and fun. Uh, how I pull these uh, GIFs are I use uh, online sources for these GIFs. So for GIFs, it's mostly uh, Jiffy.com. Uh, for videos, it's this uh, uh, service called Vlipsy.com, uh, which essentially has these short video snippets of reaction snippets, information snippets of uh, cut out from various sources as well. So those are uh, basically the online sources that I use. At the same time, you also have the ability to customize him by including your own local database of custom GIFs and responses. So if you, for example, are a huge maybe Star Wars or Superman fan and you want all your responses to just be through a custom curated set of uh, GIF responses that you have collected over the years, uh, you can just have him use those um, at that local database of GIFs to respond as well. So the, the plans to Pico are uh, open source. You put them online. Is that the is that the current version or is that an older version of Pico that, that has the plans online? So, so, uh, so the, the older version has all the plans online, including uh, the electronics and the hardware, but that was... A, a, it was, wasn't a production ready prototype, to be honest. It was just like a prototype that I had hacked together, but it was not something that would scale up to more people um, and would not be accessible to more people. So the current version, the code is completely open source. It will be open source and there's a link to the GitHub um, repository as well so that people can add in their own skills. Uh, they can become part of the community and they can c contribute back to the community, whatever they have developed for their specific use cases. Because like over the course of this uh, this entire Kickstarter and, and prior to this, I've heard of so many interesting use cases that people have come up with, which I myself would never have been able to even uh, dream and imagine of. Yeah, and, and it's not like it's outside of a, a you know, it's a, it's a language that other, uh, you know, developers and hardware, you know, enthusiasts don't understand. It's based on the Raspberry Pi. So like you said, there's exactly. already a very rich ecosystem of knowledge and hardware that's supported and all that kind of stuff. So hackability exactly. sounds like a big benefit. Um, I've noticed in a lot of the things that I've, that I've seen through the Kickstarter and your kind of intro video and stuff that the videos and GIFs that play, it's, it's almost like, so Pico, Pico moves as it's playing things, which gives it a certain personality, yes. but it's almost like the movements are timed with the content. For example, there's one of Keanu Reeves, I think for the matrix where he kind of, he kind of looks towards the camera and you see Pico kind of lean forward. Oh yeah. And it's kind of time. And I don't know <laughs> if that's just luck or is there some sort of like a uh, content scanning to kind of sync up with motions? How does that work? Uh, no. So uh, content scanning is definitely some, uh, uh, 
it's like a great idea. Yeah. It's technically a, a challenging idea, but that's something that I'm exploring and a couple of other people also are interested in the project are exploring themselves. Uh, right now, it does not do any content scanning. So a lot of the timing that you see yeah. was based on luck. So essentially, when you program in a response, what you can select is you can select a specific movement that you want to attach to that response. Uh, so it's like look up, look down, look left, look right, nod, uh, bounce up, bounce down. You can set like a speed or timing to it, which you uh, can be depending on the type of non-verbal cue you want to give. And you can program everything else. You can say what kind of LED animation you want the, that goes along with it, what kind of response category you want, and what essentially you want him to do. So uh, so all of this is going to be built out, one, as an extremely accessible way to be able for anybody who doesn't have the technical skills to add in a response, a custom response, and at the same time for people who do want to dive in deeper to the code to modify it to their heart's content and, uh, and build out whatever responses they want. Nice. So people who follow the the weird, uh, nerdy, wonderful um, maker uh, scene on the internet might know you from some of your other projects. Uh, one was the Mar Super Mario AR, I believe it was in Central Park. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, so the Super Mario uh, AR project in Central Park. So so yeah, I, I get a lot of questions about, about that one. So that was essentially um, a project that I, I built um, for the Microsoft HoloLens. It was not affiliated to Microsoft or Nintendo in any way. It was just kind of my own personal exploration of uh, a first person area, AR. So I basically recreated the entire iconic first level of Super Mario Brothers as a life-size first person game that you could play uh, in as Mario. So you would essentially be the player moving through this entire, um, entire life-size Mario level and you could complete it um, and have all the interactions that we were used to of uh, seeing in a, on a flat 2D screen, but actually experience them in, in 3D, in volumetric 3D. That is amazing. Of course, of course, uh, if anyone's ever used the HoloLens, though, what you're seeing here is like a full world surrounded by all this stuff, which would be freaking amazing. But HoloLens exactly. kind of limits you to this like credit card size view. Yeah. So it, everything it else is kind of blocked out. Exactly. So it does uh, limit you. To, so so what you're kind of seeing on screen right now is probably uh, it's got like maybe 20 percent a little extra real estate than what I was actually seeing um, through the HoloLens itself. Uh, but but yeah, yeah. Uh, Love it. The fact that Mario also worked for this is because it's a very linear game. So all the action that's happening is kind of happening in front of you. So and it happens a little bit further ahead of you. Uh, so it, that also kind of worked well within the constraints of the Holo HoloLens's limited field of view. Wow, that is so cool. I love this. <laughs> so yeah. you 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 said earlier you like to uh, make people fall in love with things, but I mean, really, all this stuff just makes people smile. And there's so much uh, not to smile about when you go on the internet. So it's just so <laughs> it's uh, so wonderful. Tell me about the the lumens, the smart shoes. Yeah, so lumens, smart shoes were also just. I mean, so so a lot of my projects are kind of explorations, and the exploration point of view of either me learning a new a new skill because all of these skins are quite uh, recently acquired over the past uh, past couple of years. So lumens were smart shoes that you could uh, control and customize via uh, an iPhone app. So they were completely three D printed, and they had these entire uh, LED, I guess this uh, LED chain. Uh, embedded in that 3D uh, in that 3D printed shoe itself, and you could customize them, have animations. You could walk uh, walk around in them, as you saw in the video. Um, and and basically, it was just a, another thing to kind of bring a little bit of light into people's lives. Well, Abhishek, thank you so much for joining us. If you like Pico or you just want to support uh, DIY and just people making things to make other people really smile, cool you stuff. can do that too. Uh, check out his Kickstarter. You can find it at peeqo.com. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, I love what you're doing. It's yeah. really cool stuff. Thank <laughs> Take you. Take care. Right, see you. Bye-bye. Yeah, best of luck. All right, up next, what your favorite technology gadget might be hiding from you. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by FreshBooks. Uh, FreshBooks is all about helping you 
uh, set new goals for your business and be able to control the money aspect of your business in an easier way, a more straightforward way. You can set those business goals and prepare for next year's tax season with FreshBooks, uh, the ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software that puts you in control of your business. FreshBooks in, uh, is full industry standard accounting for users of all levels. Even if you happen to be new to accounting, it makes it really easy to get in. With FreshBooks, your financial health will no longer remain a mystery. You can generate very quickly uh, and access accounting reports like the general ledger, the balance sheet, and the FreshBooks dashboard. You can send professionally uh, looking invoices in seconds. See immediately, you can see sent, paid, overdue, and viewed. Yes, viewed invoices so you know that they actually looked at it. Maybe they haven't paid yet, but they definitely looked. And get paid directly from your invoice an average of two times faster. Uh, you can create proposals with rich text content and images and request your client's e-signature, automatically update expenses daily in bulk, or you can simply upload a picture of a receipt and FreshBooks will do the rest. FreshBooks integrations further automate your workflow, Acuity Scheduling, PySync, MailChimp, Everlance, and a whole lot more, lots of integrations. Uh, you can keep tabs on your business anytime, anywhere with the FreshBooks mobile app while you're on the go, check in on it. And the FreshBooks team is constantly adding new and improved features. They make sure that you know that you aren't being forgotten. Thanks to user feedback, they recently redesigned the FreshBooks time tracking experience. So logging time for the week is much faster with each project getting its own line. The day sub tab now displays detailed entries with client, project, and service in list form. So there's no more confusion regarding each block of time. Uh, and like I said, they have wonderful support. Their support team is available 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time and a video hub is available 24 Seven, So you can avoid the tax time scramble for next year. Uh, maybe maybe you found yourself tied up this year. Plan ahead. Avoid it for next year. Upgrade to FreshBooks uh, for effortless invoicing and accounting. You can try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash TNW and enter Tech News Weekly in the How Did You Hear About Us section. That's freshbooks.com slash TNW. And we thank FreshBooks for their support of this show. Hey, good news, everyone. We all like feature upgrades to our technology. Am I right? Am You're I right, right, Megan? Yes. Yeah. Well, if you happen to have the Nest Security Alarm system, then you'll love that it's finally getting Google Assistant support. Or maybe you paid close attention to the system before you purchased it and never once saw any mention of an onboard microphone, something that would be required in order for a human to bark voice commands to the now assistant enabled device. In other words, Google is now activating a microphone on its hardware, a microphone it never disclosed even existed inside of its hardware. Uh, and there are a lot of, let's just say, privacy aware consumers out there these days who might care to know about the existence of a microphone on something that they install in their home, uh, especially that happens to be owned by a company who continues to kind of get a little heat for being too thirsty for our data uh, and you know having control over it. So I think it's just kind of, upset like it's not surprising that a device like this would have a microphone but it is surprising when they didn't tell you about it and it was listed nowhere in the specifications i know we've talked to plenty of people here on the network that are like i wouldn't dare bring a voice assistant of any kind into my home i'm just not going to take that chance because you never know who's on the other side listening uh so they would hear this and they'd be like well that you should have told me because then I would not have bought it. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think we should have a, a, a segment on the show where we call uh, we call it "Is this sinister or stupid?" Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sinister or stupid, and I'm going to go with stupid. Yeah, on this. I, I would like. I mean, I they. Agree. I believe them that they just sort of didn't uh, didn't mention it. And yes, maybe we should all go around assuming every piece of technology we bring into our house has a microphone in we it. We shouldn't have to. Um, we, they should have revealed that. Yeah. And But I do think, I do not think this was sinister. I think it was just plain stupid. It's really stupid though. Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah, so so you, you, you make the point that Google basically admitted that this was an error. They said the microphone wasn't listed in the specifications, though it should have been listed there. They never intended for it to be a secret. I would I would agree with you. It it feels more like a mistake than it does an outright like hey 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 we're gonna get a microphone inside these homes. But when you're a company like Google, especially a company like Google, but any company should care about this. You really should know 
better than that. That seems like a pretty big omission. At the same time, it is nice when you're a hardware company. I imagine I'm not a hardware company, but I imagine it would be nice to be able to come out with, uh, you know, a big feature upgrade on something that people already have like that. That surprises people. That tells people that you still care about the hardware. You're bringing new, meaningful updates. So that's good. Mm -hmm. It's just the fact that it was tied to this piece of hardware that a lot of people right now in this moment in time are likening or, or, you know, kind of putting on the same level as like surveillance hardware. Uh, it's a hard pill to swallow once you discover what actually happened. Yeah. Cause I mean, they've, they've had devices where they came out and said specifically, like there is no microphone in there, you know, that they've been proud of that fact. So it's very weird that they, um, forgot to mention this, but I mean, and this is also why, uh, teardowns from places like I fix it are so important because they'll mm -hmm. take apart things. I look to see, and they did have a teardown of this device, but they didn't see it either, I guess. Well, and that's what kind of blows me away yeah. is that, and, and I fix it is not the only company doing teardowns, mm -hmm. right? Like there's a market on YouTube and, and, and the journalism, journalistic community of tearing down hardware period, being the only one out there that's actually torn things down. So there are a number of people always tearing down all of these mm -hmm. products, it's interesting that none of them discovered, or if they did, they didn't make the connection of, hey, wait a minute, this is a microphone. And while that's not normally a strange thing to find in a device like this, compare that to the fact that they never disclosed it. Like no one made that connection. Yeah. Um, is, is, is the microphone really hard to find or yeah. does it not look like a microphone or what's going on there? I don't really know. I know that's, uh, <laughs> I, I was thinking when I read this story, it would be great if we had like, like nutrition labels on our technology devices, but like privacy labels. So instead of, you know, instead of like this might cause cancer or this, you know, has so much fat, it's like what the privacy level, like has a microphone, you know, has a camera that you can't cover. Like those, kinds of things just so you could look at a label and see like this is how secure or insecure this what is the is. what is the point score oh this is a 77 out of 100 <laughs> right i only buy 80 and up yeah exactly yeah. you could have like a food pyramid for yes. privacy where it's like you can have like just a few cameras at the very top of the pyramid you know, my, is an yeah, eye right, looking exactly. at you yeah exactly <laughs> Just staring at you into your soul. And Google has had issues uh, in, in the past. Of course, Google's a big company. They've been around a long time at this point. Uh, if you remember back in 2010, the Google Street View debacle where, mm -hmm. the, where they found out that the Street View cars were slurping up Wi-Fi data. And Google at the times, you know, as bad as the optics were around that, said, hey, you know what? That... Yes, that was happening, and that was not not a good thing, obviously, uh, but it was an accident, and accidents do happen for everyone, even ginormous right. corporations yeah. like Google. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, but Apple's uh, FaceTime bug was yeah. an accident. Yeah, but mm -hmm. still, the the fallout from that and the, the, the weight of that accident is magnified, mm -hmm. I'd say, because they are who they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my story that I want to discuss this week uh, was written by frequent guest of the show, Taylor Lorenz. Uh, it was a thoughtful piece in the Atlantic about sharing, sharenting, 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 the practice of sharing photos, videos, and stories of our kids online before they're even old enough to understand what's going on. She talked to dozens of kids uh, about how they felt when they Googled themselves for the first time. And I wanted to discuss what you thought our responsibility is. Uh, what, what responsibility do we have to our kids keeping them off the internet and by keeping them off the internet, I mean keeping the photos we take of them, the funny stories we tell about their lives off of social media. I have to, like, I'm, I'm curious. I would be curious to, like, step, you know, step into a child's shoes and discover this for the first time, right? Like, live your life in bliss as a, as a child, carefree and everything. And then that one day go online and do a search for your name and find this rich history that knows, you know, everything about you. And then to realize, like, that's there because your mom or dad shared it, you mm -hmm. know, they, they chose for you to do this. Um, and, and I mean, the article, I love Taylor Lorenz's work. She does such a great job on, on this uh, type of stuff. And uh, the article does a really good job of showing like some kids totally don't care. Yeah, they're, they're like, like wow, more. I'm famous. I want more yeah. photos of me on the internet. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> it's, it's almost like they feel famous once they realize that people are talking about them. Yeah. And then there are other kids that are, that are bummed because they didn't have the choice and they feel like, man, you know, this, this isn't like crazy pieces of data. They, they know that I'm in gymnastics. They, you know, the, the internet knows that, uh, I go, I'm go to this school or, or whatever. I speak Spanish or, I speak or, Spanish know, or yeah. whatever. It's not like the 
hyper, you know, super detailed personal information, but in aggregate, it kind of is. And we talk about that on the network all the time, mm -hmm. how all these disparate uh, data points can be collected and combined and come up with a pretty rich outline of what this person is. They had no choice in that yet. Mm -hmm. Now they know that their lives to a certain degree have been judged by who knows who. Right. because of it. Yeah. So I had a pretty amazing mommy blog um, back in the day. <laughs> I'll, I'll say so. Was it was it Jumping Monkeys? Jumping Monkeys. Okay. Um, and, you know, it was like when blogging first started. So it was yeah. like 2002 and I was on tech TV and like we were trying out the te technology and I wrote all about my pregnancy. Like I brought my, you know, sonogram to TV, like that video still on YouTube. But I, you know, I, I wrote all about the experiences I wrote about. You know, I, I was never like... Uh, I don't know. Like they were, all my kids are really small. I would never like take pictures of their meltdowns. I don't think, but it was a lot of personal stuff. Like mm -hmm. it was, it was a diary before I realized what that meant, you know, like what it really public meant. public diary. Yeah. And yeah. I, t I took it down. Like it's d gone. And, um, you know, I mean, gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's internet gone. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm sure if someone dug, they could, but I mean, it yeah. is not it online anymore because I, and I did that for my kids. And I asked them, you know, have you ever Googled yourself and found, you know, pictures that I posted of you that, that upset you? And my daughter said, <laughs> Uh, no. Um, she said what upsets her the most is before I would give her Instagram when she was in fifth grade, uh, she had Pinterest and she's super embarrassed about the stuff she posted herself on Pinterest, which is <laughs> nothing embarrassing, but it's like you're, imagine your 15 year old self, you know, going back to your fifth grade self, whatever yeah, you did totally. was super embarrassing. Totally. So I was like, oh good. She did it herself. I didn't do it. I mean, as a fifth grader <laughs> posting on Pinterest, you're posting about, you know, the, the things that, that define you yeah, to a certain degree. Right. Um, and I could totally see that, you know, even two years later, you know, when you're that young and you look back a couple of years like, oh my God, I was so lame, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, why, why did I think that a, a pink wall was, was going to be so great? Why did I let the internet, you know, mm -hmm. the world know that? Yeah. Um, one, another thing that I thought was interesting was this kind of the, the determination of what's too young to navigate the web compared to the fact that their parents, like, like if a parent says, well, you can't, you can't search the internet mm -hmm. because you're too young to do that. It's, it's unsafe for you yet at the same time, their parents are sharing, you know, their entire identity mm -hmm. online. And to be that kid, to be in a point in a, in a place where it's like, I, I am not old enough to be trusted to surf the internet yet. My entire identity is everywhere on it already. And mm -hmm. I want to know what's there, you yeah. know, like what, what is that age? I'm I'm not really quite sure, right. but I know it is, it's complicated. And I definitely like, you know, some of my friend, my kids, friends, follow me on Instagram. Um, and I know that. And so I'm definitely more careful. My kids follow me on Instagram and I'm more careful about what I post. Everybody's there. checking on mom. Make yeah. sure mom doesn't share any <laughs> right. embarrassing and I, photos. I always ask now. Yeah. I always ask. And a lot of times they say no and I'm bummed because I'm like, well, that's an adorable picture of you. And right. they're like, nope, you know. And, uh, but on Twitter, I'm not so careful, which is funny because I mean, Twitter is every, you know, that stuff's not going to go away. Like I'm not going to, but I just don't, always ask their permission with Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and I probably should. I know that I should. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll be better about that. But, you know, it's... It's a, it's a tough thing because we're proud of them and we want to share yeah. how amazing they and are. And that's what you do now. It's yeah. You tell everyone about <laughs> the, the, the wonderful things that are happening in your lives. I mean, I, so, so I just, you know, last week posted a review for a Harry Potter coding wand on episode three of Hands on Tech. And in that video, my nine-year-old daughter is, is featured, right? And I did explicitly ask her permission. Do you want to be in this video? It would be of you playing with this, you know, and everything like that. And of course, she's like obsessed with YouTube in any way she can get it. So she's like, wait a minute, you mean I'm going to be on YouTube? Yes, I want that. Yeah. So I take that permission as, okay, good enough. I will I will do this respectfully. You know, I, I kind of put in, the, added in there a handful of times some video from her, um, from her experience with it. Um, but like my five-year-old, if my five-year-old says, yeah, share it. Yeah. Is that like, what age is a kid able mm -hmm. to make the determination that's going to stick? You right. know what I mean? Because yeah. five-year-old seems kind of young. But if I ask my five-year-old and say, do you mind if I post this video of you online? She's probably going to say yes, because she just doesn't understand right. the depth of that. And even when you get the permission, it's hard to know whether it's a good idea or not. Right. And when she's 15, is she going to yeah. remember that she said yes? And, and she'll come back and she'll be like, well, I was five years old. Yeah. Of course I said dad. yes, but, I, but you shouldn't have listened to me, dad. <laughs> it's like, oh, you can't win.
Uh, well, um, let us know your thoughts. Uh, you can email us, tnw at twit.tv, uh, if you have any thoughts on either of our stories, uh, Sherrington or uh, Sinister or Stupid. Yeah, Google. <laughs> right. Emoji Law and a hands-on with the Galaxy S10. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by LinkedIn Talent Solutions. The right hire can make a huge impact on your business. That's why it's so important to find the right person. But where are they? You can post a job on a job board and hope the right person will find your job. But think about it. How often do you hang out on job boards? Don't leave finding someone great to chance when you can post your job to a place where people go every day to make connections, to grow in their career and discover job opportunities. Of course, I'm talking about LinkedIn. Most LinkedIn members haven't recently visited the top job boards, but nine out of 10 members are open to new opportunities on LinkedIn. And with 70% of the US workforce on LinkedIn, posting on LinkedIn is the best way to get your job opportunity in front of more of the right people. People who are qualified for your role and ready for something new. It's the best way to find the person who will help grow your business. Hurry to linkedin.com slash tech news. And if you go, you will get $50 off your first job post. That's $50 off your first job post. Go to linkedin.com slash tech news and get $50 off that first job post. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn.com slash tech news. All right. Emoji, like it or not, is a growing and extremely popular expression of modern communication. We can say a lot with a few little pictures, but as it turns out, pictures can be worth a thousand words or perhaps a thousand meanings. Uh, when it comes to tracking communication for the purposes of the legal system, courtroom trials are increasingly having to grapple with the varied possibilities of emoji uh, and emoticon interpretation, and courts are ill-prepared to understand. Joining us is Eric Goldman, a Santa Clara University law professor who's been keeping track of the complicated life of emoji in U.S. courtrooms. Welcome, Eric. Yeah, hi. It's great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. So yeah, thank you. why don't we kick things off by kind of setting the stage a little bit, describe maybe, I don't know if there's like a specific court case that really illustrates the challenge here. Uh, what would you say? I, Cause you've been following this for a while now. So you've been envisioning uh, a, a reckoning an emoji reckoning of sorts. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, I've been tracking every emoji and emoticon case I can find, uh, about 150 over the last 15 years. Um, and most of the time, they don't get into the good stuff. Um, they're simply recited as uh, as part of the evidence that the court considered. Um, the court doesn't actually discuss them. They aren't part of the uh, – they don't determine the outcome of the case. Um, to me, the my favorite emoji case actually is an Israeli small claims court case that came out a couple of years ago um, that involved a uh, landlord and prospective tenant discussing the tenant's interest in the apartment. And the tenant sent a message that included a string of six emojis that the court ultimately concluded signaled that the tenant wanted to take the apartment and therefore the landlord was justified in not renting it out for a period of time and that could get, be compensated for having held off the market. So that was a good example of how the emojis were part of the communications and they actually were part of how uh, the parties ended up um, assessing each other's interest in each other. So um, do you feel like now more than ever, I mean, obviously 150 cases more or less, you know, over the, the however many years, uh, it's not a whole lot of cases <laughs> to begin with, but do you feel like it's it's ramping up at this point? I feel like emoji as a, as a form of communication more so than emoticon, like right now is just has exploded. Uh, yeah, people are embracing emojis in their uh, daily usage. Um, and so as more emojis are used in our conversations online, they're going to show up more frequently in court cases. So that um, uh, you can kind of see how it's a leading indicator as the uh, as the uh, uh, communications change, then a few years later, the courts uh, start catching uh, that change. Um, so uh, emoticons are rarely used in court cases anymore. They had a fad for a while. Um, emojis are the ones that are showing up. And 30% uh, of all uh, emoji uses just took place 
uh, this last year. So um, you can see as you're screening, scrolling through the um, uh, screenshot there, you can see how it's just ramping up in a typical J curve. Um, so they're coming to the courts. Um, and as they come to the courts, we're going to see more what I'll call edge cases, more situations where the um, uh, the emoji is really a key part of the, uh, the court's analysis. Hmm. So are emoji more difficult to understand than regular language? I mean, like sarcasm, like if I say like, oh, I'm going to kill you, you know, like that can be interpreted different ways. Are, how are emoji different than just regular language? It's a great question. And I think your baseline instinct is absolutely right. Emojis are just another way we're talking to each other. And because of that, emojis um, are going to be interpreted like all the other things that we interpret uh, beyond text. So we absolutely interpret vocal inflections or um, uh, ways that people are looking at each other or the hand symbols that they're using. Um, these are all things that courts have been dealing with for centuries. So there's nothing new in terms of trying to figure out the meaning of non-textual communication. The question is, is there anything that's unique, special, or different about emojis? And I do think there are some things that are, are unique or different about them. And the most obvious one is that emojis uh, look different on different platforms. Mm -hmm. An Apple's depiction of emoji might look different than an, an Android's depiction. And that kind of um, uh, disparity in how they're depicted is something that I think is going to be a little bit different. It's like if you use that same vocal inflection, but I heard a different vocal inflection because of the way the technology mediated it, that would be the better analogy for an emoji. Mm -hmm. hmm. Now, also kind of reading up on this, emoji isn't really appearing in the court record that a jury reads from. If it's such a part, such an important part of communication, and if, let's say, a, a block of text can mean two different things based on you know whether the emoji was there versus not, uh, and the the many different variations of, or interpretations of what that emoji actually stands for. Why is it not being included in the court record? Do they not? Does the court not see the importance, or is it a technological barrier that keeps it? Like we don't have emoji worked into our court record system. I'm sorry. Uh, what is it? <laughs> yeah. So. Um in general, let's talk about how evidence is presented to a fact finder. Normally, we talk about juries. Sometimes judges will be the fact finder. But let's talk about juries. Um, most of the time, the juries get to see the evidence in question. So if it's an email, they'll get to see the text of the email. Um, but there are times at which that doesn't make sense. For example, if the um, uh, evidence might contain some extraneous uh, information, you might actually not want the jury to see the whole uh, evidence. It might cause them to actually misinterpret um, the evidence. So uh, there are times at which it makes sense to orally read to the jury uh, evidence rather than letting them see it. Um, in a situation like that, then you've got the situation, what happens when you run into the emoticon or the emoji? Um, how uh, is that supposed to be shared with the jury? Um, and the courts are going to figure that out. But it starts with the premise that the emoji is an essential part of the communication. If it's treated as a frivolous or non-significant part, then it won't be given the same kind of credit. But mm. really, I think we all know better. Um, now, when the emoji is presented as visual evidence, I do want to note that if the emoji looked different between the sender and receiver, just showing one version of the emoji is still incomplete. It actually yeah. is still misleading the jury. So um, even in the case where they're seeing it, the lawyers still have to do some behind the scenes work to make sure uh, that the jury is getting the full information. Yeah. Now, do you do any work in copyright law and emoji? Like, I know that the platforms, like you know, Microsoft owns its you know smiling poop emoji, and Apple owns its smiling poop emoji. Like, is that correct? Like, but who? I mean, is it confusing who owns uh, the intellectual property of an emoji? <laughs> Yeah, it is, unfortunately. Um, let's start with the basics, that uh, emojis are capable of being owned under intellectual property laws, which blows a lot of people's minds. How is that even possible? Emojis should be free like the air. Um, but, uh, but in fact, um, uh, individual emojis, so the single pile of poo depiction could very well qualify for copyright protection. Um, Apple, for example, has registered hundreds, if not thousands, of different individual emoji depictions um, and uh, claims a copyright in each of those individual depictions. Um, they can also have copyright in the emoji set. 
the way in which the set has its own particular unique attributes or the collection of which emojis are included in the set, that's also potentially eligible for copyright protection. And emojis are also potentially eligible for trademark protection. In fact, that's not really even controversial. We have many symbols that are um, uh, commonly used that can be used for trademark purposes in a particular industry niche. Um, so the short answer is that individual emojis are covered by copyright and trademark law, and emoji sets might also uh, be covered by copyright and trademark law, and it creates this rights thicket where anyone who wants to come up with a new emoji set or who wants to use someone else's emoji set has to figure out if they're legally allowed to do so. Hmm. What would you recommend or what would you suggest for uh, judges who encounter you know, emoji in, a, in an increasing rate? What, what could they be doing differently that could help in, in all of this? Yeah, there's two main things that they could do differently. First, they they should be aware that emojis might look different to different people. And so they should be expecting to see all the different depictions, not just whatever one lawyer introduces and says, this is the canonical version of the emoji. That's probably incomplete. In addition, the judges should make sure that they include the emojis that, they, uh, that were in evidence in the actual court opinion, rather than saying there was an emoji here when they restate the evidence. They should actually show the emoji that was issued, or if there were multiple depictions of that emoji, they should show the multiple depictions. So uh, that's something judges just don't think about. They think of the emoji as not critical evidence um, in the opinion. Opinion, and I think that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. I, I know you also work in privacy law. Um, I, I see your name everywhere. I also see that you have the monkey selfie behind you. Um, <laughs> were you involved in the monkey selfie case also? No, but everyone loves the monkey selfie case in my <laughs> community. True. And who doesn't love Naruto? He's so cute. <laughs> he is cute. I can't even remember where that came down. Like who owns the, who owned the selfie? Uh, that actually was a win. Nobody owns a selfie. Oh. Uh, the selfie is free for all of us to use. So I was able to buy that uh, particular image on the cheap because I didn't have to pay anyone any copyright royalties to use it. <laughs> didn't even have to pay the monkey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now with a smiling mo monkey selfie emoji, that's the emoji we need. And then who would own that? That would be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. You let me know when you work through the analysis on that okay. one. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, you write that you're still waiting for a meaty emoji ruling uh, to come your way out of all this. You know, like you said earlier, about 150 cases, nothing like in incredibly pivotal around decide the de being the deciding factor of a case. What what do you envision that will be when it happens? I mean, it's inevitable that it probably will happen at some point. The uh, at some point, the pinnacle emoji case. But what what do you think is going to happen? I mean. Because emojis are showing up in all different kinds of cases, there's all different ways that we might get that really big first analysis. Um, let me just give you some examples of what might occur. Um, one obvious example would be contracts. Somebody uh, says uh, an emoji uh, speak, uh, sure, I agree to those terms. And then they include emoji that's designed to be sarcastic or facetious. The same as the vocal inflection like you guys used earlier. Uh, it's like, sure, I would do that. Um, and so that would be the kind of thing where there could be millions of dollars at stake in that contract um, where the emoji is actually designed to uh, uh, destroy or eliminate the uh, contract formation. Um, another example would be some kind of threat case where someone uh, is accused of having engaged in threatening behavior, like I'm going to go hurt this person. Um, but then the emojis signal that they're joking or they're not really serious about it. It's just an overstatement. Um, and uh, yet uh, the person might feel in fact threatened um, uh, or the court, uh, I'm sorry, the police might think that it was still a true threat even though the emoji uh, might uh, feel otherwise. So this could literally be the difference between someone going to jail for potentially years or walking away scot-free um, based on how we interpret the emoji in the context of these alleged threats. Well, it's easy to think about emoji as being fun and games and uh, so so light and because emoji are usually used in, a very, in a very light ways uh, in how we communicate. But it's also very interesting to um, kind of analyze it through this legal lens and realize just how complicated it makes interpretation of language. And yeah, it just seems like it's going to get uh, worse over time. Eric Goldman, uh, blog.ericgoldman.org. Is that where you want people to kind of follow your your thoughts on this topic going forward? Absolutely. And uh, when we do get that meaty case, I'll be blogging up there. <laughs> right on. Eric, really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. All right. Take Thank care. You. Best of luck. 
Samsung revealed the Galaxy S10 yesterday. Jason and Leo uh, did their astute commentary about you know all, it. yeah, about all the announcements. Um, <laughs> but today we get to talk to Mark Spoonauer, who's had a Galaxy S10 review unit uh, for a bit, and he has some thoughts. Welcome back oh. to the show, Mark. Hey guys, how are you? Hello. Great. So, uh, first, was there anything yesterday that we didn't already know about the phone before the announcement? <laughs> <laughs> Given all the leaks and everything else, this is probably like the worst leaked or biggest leaked phone in history, right? So there, there were very little in the way of surprises. Uh, it was nice to see that the 5G version is going to be real and is coming to multiple carriers. It's going to be on Verizon first. So that was nice to see. I think the biggest surprise was that they led with the Galaxy Fold. Yeah. Given the fact that that's not coming out until April, we were talking with some, you know, some of my colleagues, and and some people said that it actually sort of like stole their own thunder, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. In terms, because like, oh, okay, there's like here's this amazing foldable phone, and then oh yeah, we have this S10 to announce. I think what I found interesting about that, a couple of things. First of all, if this was an Apple event, if this mm -hmm. was an iPhone event. They right. probably would have saved the fold for the end, right? Yep. They, that would have definitely been the one more thing. So Samsung loves to kind of mold, in many ways, loves to kind of mold its approach to Apple. That was very, like, anti-Apple or opposite of Apple. And second, uh, what was the second? It was, I, I blanked on the second <laughs> one. Was it just that it's $2,000 and it's not a consumer product, but then, of course, everybody's really sort of talking about it as if it's a consumer product? Well, they, they even pointed it out as being a luxury item. So even they were willing to except the fact that not everybody's going to want to buy this, even though it looks really cool. Yeah, it, it may be for like the 1% or maybe 2%. Um, but but remember, you know, when you think about, I think like the top spec Galaxy S10 uh, with all the storage and everything else, like comes out to $1,600. So it's not that huge of a leap to that's go to true, something like true. this. Uh, so I don't know. So... Again, I actually think they're going to sell out of them. There's probably going to be a limited run device. It's sort of executive jewelry. And I, I think it's really more of a statement piece. Like when you think of it, like in terms of like a car dealership, this is like the sort of thing, like a, it's supposed to have like a halo effect for the brand. It gets people talking about Samsung as an innovator. And I think they did that. But to your point, there was an audible groan <laughs> <laughs> in the theater when they dropped the price. So, and, and, you know, we, we promoted it on uh, Reddit as well. And, and like the first comment that I got back, I can't really say like all the words that were in it, but it was something, <laughs> so it was something about the price being something stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so I don't know, but at, at the same time, this is a new technology. I think we have to wait, you know, this is the first of its kind, or at least the first good one of its kind, probably. So it, all this technology is going to trickle down at some point to uh, more mass market price points. Yeah, you know, a couple of years from now, all of our phones will be foldable. Um, I remembered what I, where, where I was headed, was how, uh, how incredibly leaked the S10 was, but how mm -hmm. not leaked at all the Fold was, which, right. you know what I mean? Like, we knew that the Fold was coming at this announcement, Primarily because Samsung made it made it known as much that you know they they said we'll unfold for you. They gave enough clues right. that made it certain, but we really didn't know very many details. Uh, yet right. we knew everything about the S10, which Leo and I on yesterday's kind of you know uh, play by play during the live event just kind of realized yeah. like that that seems to indicate that Samsung is controlling a lot of these leaks, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're willing to accept the fact that the S10 gets out there, drum, drum up support. Obviously, that's their big flagship product. But uh, mm -hmm. when they want to withhold it and keep a good secret, they can. They prove that with a fold. Yeah, I mean, when you think back to the announcement of the Infinity Flex display, which was the first time they showed off the technology, the design was purposely camouflaged, Yeah, right? Yeah. So we really didn't know what the design looked like or how thin or thick it was uh, or necessarily how it worked. Although we did know that there's going to be uh, it would support three apps on the screen at the same time. Um, and they did introduce this, this idea of app continuity, where you'd have something on the smaller display that, that would then fold up to something bigger. But as far as the design and how it worked and the mechanics uh, of the hinge and that sort of thing, you're right. All of that was a, sur a surprise in a nice sort of way yesterday. So so what do you think about the S10? You've had it for a, a little bit. Um, who's the phone for? <laughs> well, it actually depends on which one you go with, right? So the S10e, I would say, is more for the iPhone XR customer or the alternative to that because it starts at the same price at $749, right? Uh, and... 
I would say it's actually a pretty good deal because you get an OLED display, not the LCD that the uh, the iPhone XR has, and a pretty powerful Snapdragon 855 processor. We we put up our first benchmark post yesterday. Um, here's this is a look at the uh, S10. Let's get it close to the frame here. This is the S10 uh, Plus. So you can see like that has the dual cameras uh, up there in the corner. Um, so that's so far so good with our testing around that. I'm going to do the battery test tonight. Uh, and the most pleasant surprise so far is the camera. So I only have a, like a few samples, but we're doing a comparison versus the Pixel 3. That'll be live tomorrow. And that's one of the areas that Samsung has been behind the competition, and that's camera uh, especially in low light. And so far, we were very pleasantly surprised. It looks like they've upped their game when it comes to the camera, which uh, which I think was necessary. Did you get a chance to take a close look at the uh, ceramic versions, or is that one of the ceramic versions? I'm very curious to see, because that, yeah, that sounds is, pretty glossy and nice. Yeah, so this, yeah, this is the, uh, the, the white version. Okay. Uh, so it's not ceramic, so this is like the more uh, affordable 999 version of the S10. Oh, you know, affordable for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it is going to be coming in multiple colors. Uh, some are actually reserved for the UK. Some are US only. So it's a little bit confusing. So we have a we have a guide on Tom's guide right now. Um, but yeah, the ceramic version, I think it's supposed to stand out because it's more durable than yeah. regular glass, um, and, and and it actually does make more of a style statement as well. Um, yeah, but but I think people are going to be. I think they'll be impressed by the camera quality and the overall performance gains that Samsung has made. Um, but I think to a certain degree, the biggest headlines of the day were 5G, which is not the 5G version is not coming until later. Yeah. And you have the Galaxy Fold, which is not coming until April. So they have this really tricky balancing act where they have to they have these exciting announcements. And then they have, oh, yeah, we have here's our regular S10 lineup, which is uh, when it comes to their revenue uh, is the most important thing. Mm hmm. And so those back cameras, that little uh, long rectangle, rectangle, has that been on uh, previous Galaxy phones, or is that new? Uh, so this this is new, uh, and what's the newest thing about it is the uh, the third camera, and what we have there is a ultra wide angle lens, which is a, a first for a Samsung phone. And what I like about that is it gives you more shooting flexibility. So for example, I was taking some shots outside today. And it really helps you like take a step back and get more dramatic results. So you can take your pick between the regular shot, a 2x optical zoom, or ultra wide. So that's really versatile when it when it comes to shooting. And the other big difference on the S10 Plus is that it has the two front facing cameras. So it gives you the ability to do better bokeh and other effects that Samsung has thrown on top. Is one of those front facing cameras on a wide as well? Because I know some some manufacturers, that's what they do with a the other camera on the front. Get a wide so you get a, a kind of a wide angle selfie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So you could yeah. fit more yeah. in the frame, which yeah. is, you know, yeah. I think is a welcome thing. What uh what about twelve gigs of RAM? Um <laughs> I feel like every year, I mean, and this is just the way it works, but 12 gigs has to be like the ceiling, right? Like this has to be the ceiling in, in modern terms as far as RAM on a smartphone. I've never seen it this high. Uh, did they, did Samsung do any, take any time to describe the needs that might surround 12 gigs of memory on your phone? Like what, what could possibly use that? That's, that's a desktop class memory. You know? well, I, I could tell you one thing that'll use it. Geekbench. <laughs> okay. All right. No, uh, so Plus, yes. There, there is a specs war, I think, in, to a certain degree for benchmarks and that sort of thing. But uh, a lot of people talk about uh, the ability to run multiple apps at the same time, uh, which I think is good. But I think Android software has gotten to the point where it's pretty good, where you can juggle multiple apps without having to worry about you know whether or not you have enough RAM. So I, I think we're going to have to wait and see. The version that we have is 128 gigs of storage and 8 gigs of RAM, so we don't have the, the 12 gigs. But Only we do 8 gigs of RAM? <laughs> Meanwhile, that's like, that's as large as almost anything else on the market. So Yeah, and actually standard for a premium laptop. Yep. Oh, that's unbelievable. But I guess also when you're talking about like, you know, Samsung did a good job of of emphasizing kind of the AI smarts of the camera. And this is just the direction that they've all been heading. Right. Like we've already got the cameras looking amazing. Now let's make them smarter. And at that point, you know, having a better processor under the hood, having more RAM for it to to play with uh, could come in really handy. It's speeding up all of that, all of that stuff and making it more impressive. Yeah, no, I think the AI, the scene recognition that they're doing is pretty good. It's faster than it was on the Galaxy Note 9, and now it does 10 extra scenes. 
Uh, and I also think they deserve credit for the integration that they're doing with Instagram. The fact that you could just sort of slide over and have an Instagram mode directly in the camera. So, you know, one of the, the areas where Samsung has fallen behind is sort of the ecosystem factor versus versus Apple. So it was nice to see them highlighting some of the developers on stage yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that also mm -hmm. include, uh, included Adobe with the uh, Premiere Rush video editing app. Right. What about the fingerprint sensor? How does that compare to Face ID or to the fingerprint sensor on the Pixel? Yeah, it's actually a little bit of an adjustment because I'm used to using Android phones where, you know, I reach around the back with my finger. So, mm -hmm. uh, but so far, so good. I, I think they've done a nice job with the design. It's fast. I would say it's as fast, if not a little bit faster than Face ID. Uh, and you don't have to necessarily like power on uh, the screen first. You can just sort of tap the screen to wake it up. And if your finger is already in the right spot, boom, you're already into the into the device. So I think they've done a nice job with it. And the fact that it is ultrasonic as opposed to optical, it's a little bit nerdy. But it, the idea is that it's more accurate because it creates a 3D map of your finger as opposed to just a picture. So it's supposed to be more secure and more accurate. So, so far, so good. I don't think they necessarily need all of these other things that they've been trying, like iris recognition and face recognition. Uh, but they're still there if you want it. Samsung likes its bells and whistles. Yeah. Uh, they, they kind of all feel like the need that to, to include those. They feel like that's what the market's looking for. Uh, what about One UI? Because this is kind of a new, uh, you know, a lot of people are saying that this is Samsung's best UI for its devices. Maybe that's because it's the latest one, but that it's cleaner, it's more simple. Uh, how does that fare on the S10? You know what? I, I'm of two minds about it. Like, I think in the settings menu, it's definitely welcome that it's more streamlined. But uh, if you guys actually take a look at the home screen here, let me just face it towards you. One of the things that I don't like is that some of the icon icons, can you actually make it out here? Let's see. A little bright. I think the, the reflection from the window is kind of blocking it a little bit. There you go. That's there you good. go. Yeah. So, like, one of the things that I don't like is that it's just like a little bit like my first smartphone uh, <laughs> in some respects. <laughs> Um, so it makes it more user friendly, but some of the icons are just, I don't know, there's just something that feels a little bit, uh, like play school <laughs> about it. Uh, but I do applaud them for, you know, the less is more streamlining that they've done with one UI. But I also think that they haven't gone far enough. Like, why do we still need two browsers when I load up my phone for the first time? Or why do I need a gallery app when Google photos is already there? So I, I think they could go even further in terms of just making it closer to stock Android. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think this is the kind of phone that's going to make someone switch from the Pixel or, God forbid, switch from the iPhone? Or is it going to be mostly people who just love the Galaxy and they upgrade and they're going to just decide whether they're you know, going to upgrade to this or not? I think the biggest opportunity that uh, they have is people who are on the fence between the Pixel and the, and, and the S family, right? Because... They've upped their game when it comes to the camera. And I think based on our test results, they may even surpass the, the Pixel 3 with the exception of very low light. Uh, the night sight mode on the Pixel 3 is just amazing yeah. to the point where it's not really real. <laughs> uh, you know, But people who have been waiting to upgrade their S7 or S8 or S6, I think the S10 will be a, a welcome upgrade. And I think Every other Android manufacturer is, uh, at least those in the U.S., are in trouble. I think LG in particular with, with the G8, I think they're going to have a hard time, especially if it's at $900, because that's basically in the same ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I do think overseas, you know, Huawei and, and Xiaomi and, 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 and others like that uh, are pushing the envelope on their own. And I think that they're, they're continuing to put the pressure on Samsung in a good way because they're being forced to innovate. Mark Spoonauer is the editor-in-chief of Tom's Guide. You can read his full review uh, also with Caitlin McGarry at tomsguide.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mark. All right. Thanks for having me. <laughs> we Take appreciate care. it. Take care. Take care. I think that's it, right? Mm -hmm. We've hit the end mm -hmm. of Tech News Weekly for this week. Uh, we record live every Thursday starting at 11 a.m. Pacific at twit.tv slash live. You can always be part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv. And you can subscribe to our show. If you're not already subscribed, I ask you, why not? I ask you that too. Yeah, we both ask you that sternly. Go to twit.tv slash TNW to subscribe or just go to your favorite, the place where you listen to podcasts. We're everywhere. We're on Spotify. We're everywhere. Uh, and you can follow us on the social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. And if you want to tweet directly at me uh, to tell me anything. 
really anything. I'm at Megan Maroney. You can you can open up to Megan and uh, CC me, please. I'm at Jason Howell <laughs> as well. Uh, thanks to everyone who helps us do this show. Josh is no longer here, but we have Alex sitting back there pretending to be Josh. Thank you, Alex. He Thank did you, a Bert. great job. Did a great mm-hmm. job. Uh, we appreciate all your help. Uh, Jammer B, Burke, everyone who helps us each and every week. We really appreciate it. And thanks to you for watching. We'll see you next week on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody.